Hi, and welcome to the MVAC Lab. I'm research intern Cindy Kotchik. In addition to artifacts like pottery or glass bottles, archaeologists study seeds, nuts, and other plant remains recovered during excavations. On their own, floral remains provide insight not just into the foods people were preparing, storing, and eating, but also how they used plant materials for other purposes, like basketry, thatch, or medicine. With other evidence from the artifacts, faunal remains, and features from the site, as well as information on the surrounding landscape, their explanatory power multiplies. So, let's take a magnified look at floral analysis. Check out the timestamps in the description box to jump to a particular topic. Seeds are incredibly small and often fragile, so we need to have the right equipment to find, pick out, store, and record them. This includes a microscope, usually a fairly simple binocular one, but some are more complex and have camera attachments for taking pictures, geologic mesh screens for size grading if needed, see our video about size grading to learn more about how and why we separate materials using that method, a Humboldt sample splitter for dividing samples into subsamples, a scale to weigh certain seeds like corn kernels and nutshell, a floral remains data sheet to record what we find, and a pencil for filling out forms like the data sheet and identification tags for any materials we pull from the light fraction. We also need petri dishes to hold the light fraction as we examine it, brushes and forceps or tweezers for picking through the samples, vials of different sizes, tags, and bags for the pulled remains. We usually work with the light fraction to recover plant remains. See the long and short versions of the MVAC flotation video to see how we extract light fraction full of plants and other materials light enough to float in water from soil samples through a process called flotation. Less often, we find dense clusters or layers of remains, like storage pit lining made from grasses, that can be sampled in the field. Before working with the sample, we make sure the data on the bag and the tag with it is complete and correct. And we add this to the floral remains data sheet for the sample. We also decide on a size grading and sampling strategy. Using mesh screens to separate materials by size and the sample splitter to create subsamples as appropriate. To start viewing the light fraction and looking for plant remains, we pour a small amount into a petri dish. Then, we place it under a microscope and turn on our light. We adjust the brightness and position of the lights and choose a level of magnification to clearly see and distinguish between the different materials. This microscope has a 10 power lens and can zoom as high as 40 power. Plant materials decay over time in our Midwestern soils. So at most archeological sites, only burned or charred floral remains last long enough for us to recover them centuries later. Desiccated or dried plant remains are sometimes found at more recent historic sites or in unusually dry settings. 
light fractions can contain other materials too. We might see fresh seeds, like nightshade, and roots or rootlets. We also come across non-plant remains that floated out of the soil with the light fraction. We might find fungus, snails or gastropods, small animal bones, fish scales, and insect remains like this casing and ant body parts. Some of these non-plant finds are also important for interpreting the site, such as tiny fish bones or gastropods that can help us understand the local environment and how people used it. We want to separate charred wood from the charred or desiccated non-wood seeds and nutshell we want to study. Wood has a distinctive internal structure with a linear pattern from the xylem and phloem. If wood fragments are large enough, they can sometimes be identified as hardwood or softwood, or more rarely to genus and sometimes species. We use a paintbrush to gently pick up seeds and nutshell fragments and put them in vials with labeled tags for later identification. Then we gently brush examined remains to one side of the dish to keep track of what we have already looked through. Once we have looked through all the light fraction in the petri dish and picked out potentially recognizable remains, we carefully pour what is left into a bag clearly labeled as picked light fraction. Then we repeat the cycle through the end of the sample. Once we have picked out what we think are seeds and nutshell, we try to positively identify them as close to the species level as possible. What resources do we use for identification? We look at books and other published materials, as well as comparative collections with modern or positively identified archaeological specimens. Like this example of two archaeological ground cherry seeds compared with a modern one below. Experience and training with an expert floral analyst are vital, and a specialist can verify identifications. It's important to remember that not everything is identifiable. Different seeds or plant parts can look similar, and fragments might be missing diagnostic features. So, we use caution when making an identification, and we keep and record unidentified or unidentifiable seeds so we know what we could not pin down to a family, genus, or species. Identifying a seed to the family or genus level still provides important information though. For example, seeds recognized generally as wetland grasses indicate a marshy environment. Of course, identifications need to be recorded for posterity. We fill out a floral remains data sheet with the count and or weight for each category. What features do we look for to identify plant remains? Well, plant families share distinctive shapes and other characteristics, so we can identify them at a general level. We look at the overall size and shape, which reflects the underlying shape of the seed embryo. For example, Kinopodium, commonly known as goosefoot or lamb's quarters, has a coiled embryo, as shown in these diagrams of three different species and an archaeological example below from Onalaska, Wisconsin. 
Grasses, like warty panic grass and bulrush, are more linear with an embryo near the base. And wild rice grains are incredibly linear with a distinctive groove down the middle of one side. Surface texture is another important feature. Certain seeds are smooth to lightly textured outside, like goosefoot and smartweed or knotweed. Other seeds have linear ridges or networks of ridges in a cell-like pattern, like this wood sorrel seed and these raspberry or blackberry examples from the rubus genus. The pattern can also be more random, like the ridges of a tobacco seed. Tobacco seeds are also smaller than many other seeds in the upper Midwest, which helps to differentiate them. With those guiding principles in mind, let's take a close-up look at some common seeds and other plant remains archaeologists find at sites in the La Crosse area and the broader upper Midwest. People tended gardens during the woodland tradition, but in the Oneota tradition, groups began to intensively farm corn, beans, and squash. Archaeologists might find the remains of these in storage pit features or storage pits reused as garbage pits. Corn kernels look similar to today, but they vary in shape. Some are more crescent shaped and others have straighter sides. They have a fine outer texture and are starchy inside. Depending on whether people cleaned kernels from the cob, and how they disposed of empty cobs, there might be cob or cupule fragments in a light fraction sample. This provides insight into how people processed and stored corn. Beans have a different shape from corn, but are still composed of starchy material. Some of these examples have split in two lengthwise. And here is a squash rind fragment and an example of an archaeological squash seed from a lacrosse area site. The cells in the rind are smaller toward the outer surface and larger towards the inside, which aids in identifying squash rind fragments. We also find cultigens, like goosefoot, Goosefoot seeds puff up and pop open with heat or burning, which can help us recognize archaeological goosefoot compared to fresher seeds that are dark but aren't puffed. Other examples include sunflower with an archaeological sunflower or marsh elder seed from a La Crosse County site and a modern example below it here, and little barley. These plants were not domesticated like corn, beans, and squash, but people would have nurtured their growth for better harvests. Nuts from wooded areas were major food resources as well. Some common examples from southwest Wisconsin include butternut, black walnut, and hickory. Different surface textures help us to identify these nuts, from the jagged, high ridges of the butternut to the more rounded, low ridges of the black walnut to the smoother hickory with smaller ridges and shallow furrows. The thickness of the shell aids in identification too. Nuts can look a little like corn on first glance. But nutshell, here on the left, is denser with a more compact structure. Corn is spongier and starchy looking. We have already mentioned some seeds we find at sites in the upper Midwest that have a distinctive surface texture, like raspberry and tobacco. 
A couple others are worth describing further. For example, wild rice was an important grain. Charred archaeological specimens, like this collection on the left, have the long and narrow shape and characteristic groove down the middle also seen in the earlier sketch and modern example. Even partial grains can be recognizable, like this archaeological fragment compared to a modern one on its right. Grasses provide information on the environment and how people might have used them as raw materials for things like storage pit lining. Differentiating between types of grasses can be difficult though. Some features that help with that are subtle or require examining the inside of the seed. For instance, the outer surface of a sedge seed might look like smart weed or not weed, but the inner surface will have striations or lines. After looking through the light fraction, we have an idea of the types of floral remains present and counts or weights to gauge their abundance. Now, we need to go beyond that to interpret what all that means. One question we ask is if there are a variety of species or if one or more is particularly abundant. What do the remains tell us about the types of resources available and the environments from which people collected them or in which they grew them, such as grasses from a marshy or a drier environment and nuts from trees that are part of certain forest types? We have to account for how seeds enter the archaeological record too. Did they have the opportunity to get charred in a fire or to dry out? Seeds from berries eaten out in forests or fields wouldn't have made it into storage pit features or refuse pits at a site. And certain seeds with stronger coats, like raspberries, preserve better in the soil than others. We also look at whether the species present point to a particular season, like fruits that were freshly picked in the summer or stored resources like corn and squash. Do the state and variety of remains provide information on preparation and storage methods, or on what the plant was used for, like food, cordage, thatch, basketry, or medicine? We want to understand how the floral remains fit with other information too. We look to ethnographic sources and indigenous voices for how people used plants, the activities associated with harvesting and processing them, and how people viewed their relationship to them. Examples include Buffalo Bird Woman's Garden and the online Native American Ethnobotany Database, which includes a variety of works focusing on different indigenous groups and myriad plants. The characteristics of the feature or area from which the original soil sample was taken are important too. Artifacts and faunal remains provide complementary information on subsistence, what people were eating, and seasonality. For example, deer bones indicating fall hunting and a lack of weed seeds that would be present in warmer months would both point to a fall occupation. We study how this fits with other features and remains from across the site and research on other sites in the region too. Plants abound in the upper Midwest, from grasses that can be used to make thatch, to blackberry bushes, walnut trees, and domesticates like corn, beans, and squash that provide food. In-depth analysis of floral remains opens a window into how people collected, processed, stored, and used a wide variety of plants in the past. For more information, see the description box. And to further explore archaeological topics, find links to MVAC social media, and view and subscribe to our monthly e-news, check out the MVAC website. You can also donate online to support MVAC's work, including our videos. Thanks for watching.